John McClain, Hall of Fame columnist with us, 610 in Houston, and also on numerous stations around the country because he is a go-to when it comes to the NFL and also just a damn good guy. John, thanks for your time. So uh, the NFL, they've got these decisions they've made. Obviously, Lambeau's going to host the NFL draft. They got the kickoff rule. They got the third quarterback rule. Which of them intrigues you or maybe perked your attention the most? Well, of the things you just mentioned, and thank you for the introduction, um, I think it's great that they're going to have the draft in Green Bay and have it in and around Lambeau Field, which is the cathedral in the NFL. I tell everybody, if you're going to go two places and you're a pro football fan, and you don't have to be a pro football fan, go to Canton, Ohio for the Hall of Fame, and then go to Lambeau for the Packers. And uh, I've never been anywhere in the NFL where I was treated better than you are in Green Bay. And that's the way it is for everybody because they love for fans to come in out of town so they can show off their field, the museum, and their hospitality. So it's going to be great. I can't wait till the draft is actually in Canton. You know, they call Cleveland Canton. Well, that's not right. You know, I'd be, I, I don't like that. It's either in Cleveland or it's in Canton, and it should be. In Canton, of these new rules changes, I the, they have they have neutered the kickoff, but they have to. There's too many injuries that came from kickoffs. It was great in the old days where you might have 102 or three yard kickoff returns and these monstrous collisions and wet wedge busters would go flying on like Superman into these blocking formations. But there were too many injuries. I saw two guys here had to retire because of partial paralysis, suffered on kickoff return. So even though they've made it more boring, like the onside kick, you know, there's still plenty of excitement in the NFL. But I certainly understand that uh, as far as the kickoff rule. Don't like it, but I understand it. John, um, the uh, the sale of the commanders, uh, they said all the, all the right things. Do you um... – you know, about it's going through and all that. Um, but the, they did ask Roger Goodell about D.C., and he was a little bit noncommittal on that. Do you think the the owners want them to be in D.C. proper or that the owners really care? Owners don't give a rat. You know what, Paul? Yeah. They just want the money. Mm-hmm. It's just like if you think people ask about Jacksonville. If Jacksonville were playing in London at, say, Wembley Stadium or – uh, at uh, the Tottenham Hot Spurs Stadium, which built five years ago to NFL standards, they would be making so much more money than they're making in Jacksonville. They could jack up the ticket prices. Their tickets are sold in like two minutes. They would be making a lot more. So if they're making a lot more, the NFL's making a lot more. And we all know the NFL's close to going into the poorhouse. They need all the money that they can get. <laughs> So they don't care. Now, when FedEx Field was built, I was there. I was covering the NFL. It was grand. It was, I think, Snyder got it where he could put 80 to 85,000 people in there. I think I'm surprised he didn't pay to sit on the toilet. And so he could count that as among his ticket sales. And then because he let the franchise go down the toilet, they had to reduce the capacity, and it was embarrassing. And he didn't do anything to the stadium. It was terrible. The parking lot was terrible. It's one of the most storied franchises in, in, in the history of sports. And what he did to it is just criminal. Now, he was never going to get a new stadium. But the new owner, I believe that Josh Harris's group, they would have had to have had some assurances from the government that they could get a stadium down in the district, back in the area of RFK Stadium, where they want to build it before they're going to sell out $6.05 billion for the franchise, it's only a matter of time. Has there ever been an, in, an owner in any sport who takes over and is automatically going to be as popular and as appreciated as the Josh Harris group because of who they're replacing? Yeah, hard to imagine. I they throw a parade for for Josh Harris as far as I'm concerned, and I'm one of those that's been disgruntled for a while now, and I'm glad to see some change, John. Um, we did have a, a major passing in the sports world and in pro football with uh, Jim Brown. 
uh, passing away earlier this week. John, any uh, in all your experiences, all the events, the committees, everything like that, any interactions with Jim Brown, thoughts on you know his legacy, his, his time in football, and, and all that goes with that? I started really paying close attention to pro football in 1960 when I was eight years old. My dad was such a fanatical football fan. They had the, they had the, the NFL on CBS and the new a- AFL was on NBC. And the AFL uh, was exciting. They threw the ball around like crazy. The Oilers won the first two championships, took the Dallas Texans double overtime in the third one. The Cowboys were awful, had a tie. They three yards in a cloud of dust. But it was pro football. And back then, you know, the Packers, the Eagles were the champions in 60. The Packers went on a run of five in a row, including back-to-back Super Bowls in the first two Super Bowls. But one player out of all the Hall of Famers stood out, and that was Jim Brown. He was 6'2", and he was 230, and he could run. And he, and he didn't block. A lot of people criticized him because he didn't block. Who did he need to block for? He got the ball all the time. And he used to get cheap shotted so much, the things they could do to players back then, and he broke so many tackles. And every time he got tackled, he got up really slow like he was hurt. And somebody asked him, why do you get up so slow? And he said, because when I really am hurt, I don't want the defenses to know it because I'm going to get even more cheap shots. But he never complained about it. And Jim Brown's notoriety, respect, popularity transcended sports. And one reason was he was an activist. And if you were an activist for civil rights, like Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was Lou Alcindor, and, and Jim Brown, you know, you were white people didn't like it. You know, they just didn't like it. And, and Brown didn't care. Just like Ali didn't care. Jabbar didn't care. They were doing what they thought was right for their race and that their contributions to civil rights will be recognized, appreciated, and respected because of everything they went through uh, to do it. Because as you you guys, well, y'all were old enough, 1960 was a tumultuous time in our country. Mm-hmm. You know, you had, you had riots. You had Bobby Kennedy assassinated, Martin Luther King assassinated. 1968 was the worst non-World War II or World War I year in our country's history. I tell people there's never been a year like 1968. Google it. And so guys like Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali, they, they believed in what they stood for. And the first time I met him, I know, had a chance to meet him, was at a, at a memorabilia convention here, TriStar Productions. And I was behind the scenes doing stories. One of the owners said, you want to meet Jim Brown? I said, sure. And as I got close to him, and I was looking at him from behind, and all these people were lined up, I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. I got intimidated by Jim Brown. He's the only, well, since I was a kid, Cowboys, some of the Cowboys used to come down to Waco, make appearances, and my dad would always take them to me, and I was in, I thought I'd seen God. First time I saw Tom Landry, I, I couldn't have been more captivated if, the Lord had come down to shake my hand, but Jim Brown intimidated me and no reason. It wasn't anything he did. It was just me, I guess, thinking about all the times I had seen him. Plus he had the first interracial love scene and he got to do it with Raquel Welch, who was just about the hottest woman on the planet. And that movie was 100 rifles. And I think I've seen it 50 times. And it's amazing. Art Modell, who was a new owner, got mad because he was filming a movie. He told him, look, you need to get back here uh, for off-season program, training camp, and and give up that movie business. So he said, or retire. He said, okay, he called his love. I retire. He finished The Dirty Dozen, which is still one of my favorite war movies. And when he got killed in it, I got teary-eyed. John, I was going to ask you where you ranked The Dirty Dozen, which – uh, he did a lot of movies. I, I don't know if it, if anything was was maybe overall better than the Dirty Dozen. Oh, I think the Dirty Dozen was, and one of our rifles was so famous because it was. A, I thought it was a good movie. Jim Brown was at his best when he was not the star. You know, he wasn't a great actor, but he was pretty good. But he was Jim Brown, and so the Dirty Dozen, which had an ensemble of great actors at the time, 
it was a great way for him to start his movie career. And uh, I'm just sorry they, I'm just sorry they killed him off. John, I'm glad you admitted what you said about Jim Brown. I was lucky enough to interview him. I think it was twice on Radio Raw. I brought this up in a phone segment with the guys on Friday when I was off that afternoon. He is the only one. I got a little googly over Joe Gibbs because of my Redskins Washington franchise uh, the fandom, but not Landry, not Larry Holmes or anyone else, but Jim Brown, when I Jeff Wood came around the corner and said, hey, Jim, Jim Brown's on his way, I gulped. Like, I, I had, because <laughs> it was like, I, and, and you know what was great about it? He was fantastic. And we discussed some of the issues in America. He was fantastic. It wasn't about Jim Brown. It was him being who he is. And I, I'm glad you admitted that because, you know, we try not to, but I, I did. I was, uh, I was a little bit, oh, my God. And I was ready, thank God, but uh, I just... Yeah, he was that kind of. I had that aura about him. Well, you can. I can appreciate that. At one time, the Browns were in town to play the Oilers, and I went to their hotel to pick up a good friend of mine, Tony Grossi, who still covers them. And as he was walking out, Brown's standing there, and I'm like wide eyed, my mouth's agape, and I see Jim go, "Hey, Tony, how you doing?" And Tony goes, "Great, Jim. See you at the stadium." Tony gets in the car, and I said, "You know Jim Brown?" He goes, "Yeah." I said, "Holy bleep!" Did you just spoke to Jim Brown? He goes, yeah, what's the big deal? He works for the Browns. He's there all the time. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. John, thank you very much. Uh, did we ask you last week about the NFL playoff game streaming only? Did we get into that last week with you? I can't, I, I can't remember if you did or not. I don't like it. I won't watch it unless the Texans were in it. But the local teams are going to uh, get it over the air anyway and the Texans certainly won't be in the playoffs but i don't like it but it's a sign of times to come because as i mentioned those poor nfl owners they're almost down on the corners with their hands out begging they're, for money because they, they they never get enough they cannot pay their electric bill thank you john we appreciate <laughs> your time hall of fame thank columnist. you guys thank you. hall of fame columnist houston 610 and a part of our segment with us most every tuesday around the 5 30 segment sometimes